Hello and welcome to episode 596 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. It is, of course, time for the weekly show, You Cannot Live Without Market Monday. Yes, that's right. Each Monday, I go over the biggest risers and followers in average draft position for the previous seven days, discuss whether I'm buying or selling these players at their new prices. Idea is to get you up to speed very quickly on what's happening in the best ball markets. Before we get into it here today, reminder, our early bird bundle expires this Friday. This Friday, the bundle combines DraftKit Pro, which covers best ball season long dynasty with our in-season product. And that runs through the Super Bowl. Early bird special on that bundle is up now for a limited time until Friday. Again, check it on the subscribe page, establish the run. Dot com Again, Friday night, that bundle price is going up. Two more quick, important notes for preseason slates this week, preseason DFS. If you're interested in playing preseason DFS, check out our product. That can be found separately, not part of any other bundle. And lastly, the solver is free for NFL right now. Sign up with the link that's in the show notes, and you'll be able to mess around with the optimizer on the solver. Say you like it for free. And if you have the established run preseason product, our projections will load into the solver automatically. All right, let's begin with the biggest risers from the last seven days. First one I want to talk about is Justin Ross. Justin Ross, Chiefs wide receiver, is up 14.3 spots into the 16th round on underdog. This is training camp highlight mania. So many clips out there of Justin Ross making big plays at Chiefs camp. And I get that people want Justin Ross to be a thing. I get that he had huge college games for Clemson back in 2018, 2019. And I, I want to take swings on Chiefs wide receivers. And Ross is probably, uh, maybe talented enough. But to me, this is a prime example of a swing that I take in managed redraft formats, but I don't take in best ball. Like I would be fine taking Justin Ross in round 16 of redraft. See how the rest of camp goes. See how preseason games go. See how high he can get on the depth chart. Maybe even see how week one goes, how many routes he runs in week one. And if it looks like he's going to have a real role, great, I got a steal. If not, I just drop him and I grind the waiver wire. Because in managed leagues, I actually want to be grinding the waiver wire. So many difference makers will be available there. So no issue at all in redraft taking a swing at Ross. But in best ball, obviously there's no waiver wire. If Justin Ross turns out to be inactive, uh, cut, practice squad, fifth wide receiver, sixth wide receiver. That spot is pretty dead in best ball. And I just try to avoid that at all costs. Taking zeros in best ball. You know, give me Hunter Henry over Justin Ross. Give me Devontae Parker over Justin Ross. I I just need usable weeks out of guys that I draft late in best ball. Whereas in redraft, of course, I'm taking Justin Ross over Hunter Henry over Devontae Parker. But I just need usable weeks, especially in the smaller field stuff that I'm playing in best ball. And yeah, just on Justin Ross, Specifically, I think it's definitely possible that despite the big camp that he's having, he won't have a real role come week one. I mean, we know Marquez Valdez-Scantling and Sky Moore are really likely to be the starters. Richie James plays special teams and will play in the slot. Justin Watson plays special teams and the Chiefs love having him out there for routes as we saw last year. So that leaves Justin Ross, Kadarius Toney, Rasheed Rice effectively competing for one or two spots on game day. Now, obviously I could be wrong in that projection. Obviously, Justin Ross could make his way further up the depth chart as the season goes along. But I don't think that I feel good or strong enough about those outcomes that I'm going to take him in round 16 of best ball. Second riser I want to talk about is Darren Waller. He is up 3.2 spots to the early seventh round on underdog. Another guy rising on camp buzz. I mean, Waller reportedly been unguardable, just destroying Giants camp. You know, ignores the fact that historically the Giants defense has been very, very bad against tight ends, but whatever. The point is that Darren Waller, of course, stands out massively when compared to all the other mediocre to sub-average wideouts the Giants run out there for practice every day. We're projecting Darren Waller for 18, 19% target share, which is easily highest on the team and solid generally, especially for a tight end. Now, I do think he can get higher than 18 or 19%, but I don't think that's a basic outcome. So Waller has been a tough one for me. My standard strategy at tight end is to pay up for an elite one, Kelsey, Mark Andrews, Hawkinson, or wait until much later and try to compete with volume. You know, no tight ends until round 12, but then end up with 
Higby, Laporta, Hunter Henry. You know, just skip over that middle range that starts with George Kittle and ends with Pat Fryermuth. And for that reason, I don't really have much Waller, which is a little concerning because in a vacuum, I think he's definitely solid. Oh, uh, one other quick note on the Giants. Jalen Hyatt is up 20 spots into the 16th round. I still think the three wide, re- three wide receiver set to open week one will be Slayton and Hodgins on the outside, Paris Campbell in the slot. But Jalen Hyatt reportedly just blowing the doors off at camp could see him rotating in. I'm not taking him in the 16th round because I fear he'll be a rotational deep threat for most of the year, but it is tempting in the 18th round plus if Hyatt slides there anymore. Last riser I want to talk about is Marvin Mims. He's up 11 and a half spots into the late 13th round into the 150s. Easy, easy click here for me on Marvin Mims with Tim Patrick, torn Achilles done for the season, KJ Hamler out of the picture. Mims is almost locked to the wide receiver three role and Jerry Judy and Cortland Sutton. I, I just don't know how the new regime feels about them, especially Sutton. We know there were trade rumors there in the offseason. So Marvin Mims, wide receiver three as a floor. And I'd also note that Sean Payton's first draft in charge of the Broncos, first draft, first pick, what does he do? He trades up into round two to take Marvin Mims at 63 overall, even though he had Judy, Sutton, Tim Patrick, Hamler, Dolchich, Callaway. Like clearly Sean Payton really likes what he saw out of Mims coming out of Oklahoma. And lastly, I just think Mims' skill set fits really well with Russ Wilson. And I think the Broncos offense will be far better this year just because Sean Payton is on the sticks instead of that dolt Nathaniel Hackett. So yeah, I've been part of the wave driving up this Marvin Mims ADP. Because this week's fallers, Dalvin Cook, free agent running back Dalvin Cook is down 3.4 spots to 95th overall on underdog late eighth round. I never draft Dalvin, like never. Maybe I'm the NFL. I just don't think he's that valuable to any team, really. We're talking about a 28-year-old running back with a ton of shoulder issues in his recent history. Was really bad last year. Dalvin Cook finished 50th among 60 qualifying running backs in pro football focuses grades. I'm not really surprised that Dalvin Cook didn't come to terms with the Jets. He wants a big role, but the Jets know Brees Hall is a far better player and hopefully ready for week one off the ACL. And Dalvin also wants real money, big money, which is a whole other issue, which I could spend the whole podcast on. But man, it's wild. People still love Dalvin Cook. I mean, last night we did a $2,000 buy-in live stream draft. You can find that on YouTube. Um, It was a lot of fun. You should definitely check it out. But anyways, Dalvin, I think, went in round five in that 2K buy-in last night. I I just don't get that. Now, yes, I do think Dalvin will sign somewhere. But the chances of him being a feature back, it's going to take some massive injury or Jonathan Taylor just not showing up for that to happen, I think. And then on top of that, Dalvin also has to have some juice left. So for me, even as Dalvin slips into round eight, I prefer, if I'm going running back there, I prefer Isaiah Pacheco, James Cook, even guys like A.J. Dillon, uh, Rashad Penny, who I wouldn't take in round eight, but prefer him at his call, Charbonnet, Brian Robinson. I prefer all those guys over Dalvin Cook. Second follower I wanted to talk about is Ty Chandler. He is down 6.8 spots to 206 overall early 18th round reports on Chandler out of Vikings camp have been mixed. I've seen some stuff saying, Oh, he's for sure. the running back two behind Alexander Madison. And then I've seen other stuff saying, well, Ty Chandler hasn't been that great. Hasn't separated from Kitty and Guangu or Dwayne McBride. And that's led to more rumors that Minnesota could look to add a cheaper veteran, you know, a cream hunt type. And by the way, cream hunt is visiting the saints today. You know, who knows? The first thing I'd say is that, to me, it's almost impossible for beat writers to evaluate running backs in these training camp practices. The running backs are running against air mostly. They aren't tackled to the ground. I just don't put a lot of stock in beat writer player evaluations in camp, period. Now, if it was a depth chart thing, if they said, well, Ty Chandler's not getting any first team reps, Keeney and McBride are getting all of them, or, or they're getting most of them. Well, that would really worry me. But That's not the reports that I'm seeing. So... I still take Ty Chandler in round 19, 20, where I need a fifth or sixth running back, but it's definitely risky. If they sign someone or he loses out to one of those guys, we could be looking at a zero, which I hate to take as I just talked about. So I've been mixing in more Zemir White and Gus Edwards into those round 18 and 20, 18 through 20 running back darts. I'm not opposed to Chandler, but yeah, those are the kind of the three that I mix through Chandler, 
Zamir White and Gus Edwards, at least right now. Last faller is Taekwon Thornton. He is down 14.8 spots to the middle of the 17th round. And also Mike Jasicki is down 6.1 spots to the early 17th. Man, I, I fear I blew this one. I was somewhat in on both Taekwon Thornton and Mike Jasicki about a month ago. But the bottom line is they just aren't that good at football. And that's already seems to be playing out as Thornton reportedly has been so bad that he's behind Juju Smith-Schuster, Devontae Parker, maybe Kendrick Bourne, maybe Demario Douglas. At this point, I think Taekwon Thornton is going to be a rotational vertical wide receiver in an offense that I think will be certainly much better than last year, simply due to our getting a real offensive coordinator, but still won't be explosive or even average. So yeah, I have completely stopped drafting Taekwon Thornton. As for Jasicki, I think the role will be there, you know, that split offline, quote unquote, tight end role in true passing situations, but I'd still rather have Hunter Henry. I mean, I'm expecting Henry to both play more snaps and run more routes than Mike Jasicki, and Henry is a legit good NFL player. I know I joke about the Penn State stuff all the time, but Mike Jasicki just struggles so much with the physicality of the NFL game. He's just not as good as Hunter Henry. And I get that they effectively play different positions, but Jasicki's role is going to be significantly worse. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of Market Monday. Stay tuned. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast because we have another jam-packed week coming up. Going to be talking about quarterbacks, with JJ Zacharyzen going to be going over Silva's top 150 rankings, changes that he's made there. Silva and I will release our round two player-by-player player rankings as well. So be sure you're subscribed anywhere podcasts are found and on YouTube. There is a ton of content on there we do not put on this audio feed. Again, be sure you're subscribed to our YouTube. Bundle price goes up Friday. For producer Luke, for King Editor Jackson Kane, for Jerry, the most beautiful beast in the world, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.